When historians look back at the past today, we tend to look for parallels to modern trends. So for instance, there's an entire book by Josiah Ober which posits that Athens had a kind of information sharing system that is comparable to the knowledge systems that one sees in, say, a modern corporation. It is, I think, natural for historians to interpret the past in the light of their own present. That is, in many ways, responsible for changes in historical interpretation. Um, of course, also, there is the discovery of new evidence and um, further implications of past events. But I think a lot of it is just living through different experiences that really reshape how you view the past. And that's part of why I'm so interested in H.G. Wells' The Outline of History. Um, Wells, of course, wrote The War of the Worlds, among many other sci-fi works, and he was a highly successful writer from the late 19th to early 20th centuries. In 1920, he wrote a two-volume work called The Outline of History, which details pretty much all of history at least from a very Western 1920 perspective. So this book has a lot of flaws from a modern perspective, but I think that it's useful and interesting insofar as it gives us a light into what H.G. Wells or an educated Englishman of his time thought about history. So what I'm looking at in this video is his treatment of Napoleon. Now, going into this reading, I had fully expected H.G. Wells to be somewhat sympathetic to Napoleon, especially much more so than the average British person, because I know that Wells is a socialist and that maybe he thought that Napoleon was a little bit more liberal or tasteful than the normal monarch. However, what I found instead is that he has an extremely British view of Napoleon, which is to say that Napoleon is a monster and just a horrible person. I think there's also something else at play though, in this passage, and that is the idea that Napoleon really hijacked the revolution and therefore held up progress, and that that holding up of progress and that threat to Europe's monarchs ultimately led to World War I and the devastation that it wrought, because it kept all of these pressures of nationalism caged, and it upheld artificial boundaries and then once all that pressure was released, the world had the greatest bloodletting it had ever seen. So I think that because he's writing in 1920, he's somewhat of a prisoner of the moment, and he's looking ultimately through history to find the causes of World War I. For him, that is the culminating point in history. So anyway, that's just my take on what he had to say. Um, as we'll see after he talks about Napoleon, he also has a lengthy discourse on how the Allies completely botched the settlement and failed to establish a lasting peace. And I think that ultimately what he's hinting at is that it all fell apart in 1914 and the world went with it. So without any further ado, let's look at chapter 36 of H.G. Wells's The Outline of History. This comes from book two and I'm reading from the enlarged edition. I don't know if this was edited in any way or whether it was just, um, there were just a couple chapters added about World War II. At any rate though, Let's talk about Napoleon. Chapter 36, The Career of Napoleon Bonaparte. And now we come to one of the most illuminating figures in modern history, the figure of an adventurer and a wrecker, whose story seems to display with an extraordinary vividness the universal subtle conflict of egotism, vanity, and personality with the weaker, wider claims of the common good. Against this background of confusion and stress and hope, this strained and heaving France and Europe, this stormy and tremendous dawn, appears this dark little archaic personage, hard, compact, capable, unscrupulous, imitative, and neatly vulgar. He was born, 1769, in the still half-barbaric island of Corsica, the son of a rather prosaic father a lawyer who had been first a patriotic Corsican against the French monarchy, which was trying to subjugate Corsica, and who had then gone over to the side of the invader. His mother was of sturdier stuff, passionately patriotic and a strong and managing woman. She birched her sons. On one occasion, she birched Napoleon when he was 16. There were numerous brothers and sisters, 
and the family pursued the French authorities with importunities for rewards and jobs. Except for Napoleon, it seems to have been a thoroughly commonplace, hungry family. He was clever, bad-tempered, and overbearing. From his mother, he had acquired a romantic Corsican patriotism. Through the patronage of the French governor of Corsica, he got an education first at the military school of Brienne, and then at the military academy of Paris, from which he passed into the artillery in 1785. He was an industrious student, both of mathematics and history. His memory was prodigiously good, and he made copious notebooks which still exist. These notebooks show no very exceptional intelligence, and they contain short pieces of original composition upon suicide and similar adolescent topics. He fell early under the spell of Rousseau. He developed sensibility and a scorn for the corruptions of civilization. In 1786, he wrote a pamphlet for a, against a Swiss pastor who had attacked Rousseau. He dreamt of an independent Corsica, freed from the French. With the revolution, he became an ardent Republican and a supporter of the new French regime in Corsica. For some years, until the fall of Robespierre, he remained a Jacobin. He soon gained the reputation of a useful and capable officer and it was through Robespierre's younger brother that he got his first chance of distinction at Toulon. Toulon had been handed over to the British and Spanish by the Royalist, and an Allied fleet occupied its harbor. Bonaparte was given the command of the artillery, and under, under his direction the French forced the Allies to abandon the port and town. He was next appointed commander of the artillery in Italy, but he had not taken up his duties when the death of Robespierre seemed likely to involve his own. He was put under arrest as a Jacobin, and for a time he was in danger of the guillotine. That danger passed. He was employed as an artillery commander in an abortive raid upon Corsica, and then went to Paris, 1795, rather down at heel. Madame Junot, in her memoirs, describes his lean face and slovenly appearance at this time his, quote, ill-combed, ill-powdered hair hanging down over his gray overcoat, his gloveless hands, and badly blacked boots. It was a time of exhaustion and reaction after the severities of the Jacobite Republic. In Paris, says Holland Rose, the star of liberty was paling before Mercury, Mars, and Venus. Finance, uniforms, and social charm. The best of the common men were in the armies, away from beyond the frontiers. We have already noted the last rising of the Royalists in this year, 1795. Napoleon had the luck to be in Paris and found his second opportunity in this affair. He saved the Republic of the Directory. His abilities greatly impressed Carnot, the most upright of the directors. Moreover, he married a charming young widow Madame Josephine de Beauharnais, who had great influence with Barat. Both these things probably helped him secure the command in Italy. We have no space here for the story of his brilliant campaigns in Italy, 1796 to 97, but of the spirit in which that invasion of Italy was conducted, we must say a word or two, because it illustrates so vividly the double soul of Napoleon and of France and how revolutionary idealism was paling before practical urgencies. He proclaimed to the Italians that the French were coming to break their chains, and they were. He wrote to the Directory, We will levy 20 million francs in exactions in this country. It is one of the richest in the world. To his soldiers, he said, You are famished and nearly naked. I lead you into the most fertile plain in the world. There you will find great towns, rich provinces, honor, glory, riches. We are all such mixed stuff as this, but these passages written by a young man of 27 seem to show the gift of honorable idealism rubbed off at an unusually early age. His successes in Italy were brilliant and complete. He had wanted to go into Italy because there lay the most attractive task, 
He had risked his position in the army by refusing to take up the irksome duties of a command against the rebels in Le Vendee. He had been a great reader of Plutarch's lives and of Roman history, and his extremely active imagination was busy with dreams of a revival of the eastern conquest of the Roman Empire. He got the Republic of Venice out of his way by cutting it up between the French and Austria, securing the Ionian Islands and the Venetian fleet for France. This peace, the Peace of Campo Formio, proved a bad bargain for both sides. The new Republic of France assisted in the murder of an ancient republic. Napoleon carried his point against a considerable outcry in France, and Austria got Venetia in which land in 1918 she was destined to bleed to death. There were also secret clauses by which both France and Austria were later to acquire South German territory, and it was not only the Roman push eastward that was now exciting Napoleon's brain. This was the land of Caesar, and Caesar was a bad example for the successful general of a not very stable republic. Caesar had come back to Rome from Gaul a hero and conqueror. His imitator would come back from Egypt and India. Egypt and India were to be his Gaul. The elements of failure stared him in the face. The way to Egypt and India was by sea, and the British, in spite of two recent naval mutinies, were stronger than the French at sea. Moreover, Egypt was a part of the Turkish Empire, by no means a contemptible power in those days. Nevertheless, he persuaded the Directory, which was dazzled by his Italian exploits, to let him go. An armada started from Toulon in May 1798, captured Malta, and had the good luck to evade the British fleet and arrived at Alexandria. He landed his troops hurriedly, and the Battle of the Pyramids made him master of Egypt. The main British fleet at the time was in the Atlantic outside Cadiz, but the admiral had detected or detached a force of his best ships under Vice Admiral Nelson, as great a genius in naval affairs as was Napoleon in things military, to chase and engage the French flotilla. For a time, Nelson sought the French fleet in vain. Finally, on the evening of the 1st of August, he found it at anchor in Aboukir Bay. He had caught it unawares. Many of the men were ashore, and a council was being held in the flagship. He had no charts, and it was a hazardous thing to sail into the shallow water in a bad light. The French admiral concluded, therefore, that his adversary would not attack before morning, and so made no haste in recalling his men aboard until it was too late to do so. Nelson, however, struck at once, against the advice of some of his captains. One ship only went aground. She marked the shoal for the rest of the fleet. He sailed to the attack in a double line about sundown, putting the French between two fires. Night fell as the battle was joined. The fight thundered and crashed in the darkness until it was lit presently by the flames of burning French ships, and then by the flare of the French flagship the Orient blowing up. Before midnight the Battle of the Nile was over, and Napoleon's fleet was destroyed. Napoleon was cut off from France says Holland Rose, quoting Thiers, This Egyptian expedition was the rashest attempt history records. Napoleon was left in Egypt with the Turks gathering around him and his army infected with the plague. Nevertheless, he went on for a time with this eastern scheme. He gained a victory at Jaffa, and being short of provisions, massacred all his prisoners. Then he tried to take Accra, where his own siege artillery, just captured at sea by the British, was used against him. Returning baffled to Egypt, he gained a brilliant victory over a Turkish force at Abukir, and then, deserting the army of Egypt, it held on till 1801 when it capitulated to a British force, made his escape back to France, 1799, narrowly missing capture by a British cruiser off Sicily. Here was failure enough to discredit any general, had it been known. But the very British cruisers which came so near to catching him helped him by preventing any real understanding of the Egyptian situation from reaching the French people. He could make a great flourish over the Battle of Abukir and conceal the loss of Accra. 
Things were still not going well with France just then. There had been military failures at several points. Much of Italy had been lost, Bonaparte's Italy, and this turned men's minds to him as the natural savior of that situation. Moreover, there had been much peculation, and some of it coming to light. France was in one of the final phases of financial scandal, one of her phases of financial scandal, and Napoleon had not filched. The public was in that state of moral fatigue when a strong and honest man is called for, a wonderful, impossible healing man who will do everything for everybody. People persuaded themselves that this specious young man with the hard face, so providentially back from Egypt, was a strong and honest man required, another Washington. With Julius Caesar rather than Washington at the back of his mind, Napoleon responded to the demand of the time. A conspiracy was carefully engineered to replace the directory by three consuls. Everybody seems to have been reading far too much Roman history just then, of whom Napoleon was to be the chief. The working of that conspiracy is too intricate a story for our space. It involved a Cromwell-like dispersal of the lower house, the Council of 500, and in this affair Napoleon lost his nerve. The deputies shouted at him and hustled him, and he seems to have been frightened. He nearly fainted, stuttered, and could say nothing, but the situation was saved by his brother Lucian, who brought in the soldiers and dispersed the council. This little hitch did not affect the final success of the scheme. The three consuls were installed at the Luxembourg Palace, with two commissioners to reconstruct the constitution. With all his confidence restored and sure of the support of the people, Napoleon took a high hand with his colleagues and the commissioners. A constitution was produced in which the chief executive officer was to be called the first consul with enormous powers. He was to be Napoleon. This was part of the constitution. He was to be re-elected or replaced at the end of ten years. He was to be assisted by a council of state, appointed by himself, which was to initiate legislation and send its proposals to two bodies, the legislative body, which could now vote but not discuss, and the tribunate, which could discuss but not vote, which were selected by an appointed senate from a special class, the notab notabilities of France, who were elected by the notabilities of the departments, who were elected by the notabilities of the commune, who were elected by the common voters. The suffrage for the election of the notabilities of the commune was universal. This was the sole vestige of democracy in the astounding pyramid. This constitution was chiefly the joint product of a worthy philosopher, Sillez, who was one of the three consuls, and Bonaparte, but so weary was France with her troubles and efforts, and so confident were they in the virtue and ability of this man of destiny, that when at the birth of the 19th century this constitution was submitted to the country, it was carried by 3,011,007 votes to 1,562. France put herself absolutely in Bonaparte's hands and prepared to be peaceful, happy, and glorious. Now surely here was opportunity such as never came to man before. Here was a position in which a man might well bow himself in fear of himself and search his heart, and serve God and man to the utmost. The old order of things was dead or dying. Strange new forces drove through the world seeking form and direction. The promise of a world republic and an enduring world peace whispered in a multitude of startled minds. France was in his hand, his instrument, to do with as he pleased, willing for peace, but tempered for war like an exquisite sword. There lacked nothing to this great occasion but a noble imagination. Failing that, Napoleon could do no more than strut upon the crest of this great mountain of opportunity like a cockerel on a dunghill. The figure he makes in history is one of almost incredible self-conceit, of callous contempt and disregard of all who trusted him, and of a grandiose aping of Caesar, Alexander, and Charlemagne, which would be purely comic if it were not caked over with human blood. Until, as Victor Hugo said in his tremendous way, God was bored by him, and he was kicked aside into a corner to end his days, 
explaining and explaining how very clever his worst blunders had been, prowling about his dismal hot island shooting birds and squabbling meanly with an underbred jailer who showed the show failed to show him the proper respect. His career as first consul was perhaps the least dishonorable phase in his career. He took the crumbling military affairs of the directory in hand, and after completing a and after a complicated campaign in North Italy, brought matters to a head in the victory of Marengo near Alessandria, 1800. It was a victory that at some moments came very near disaster. In the December of the same year, General Moreau, in the midst of snow, mud, and altogether abominable weather, inflicted an overwhelming defeat upon the Austrian army at Hohenlinden. If Napoleon had gained this battle, it would have counted among his most characteristic and brilliant exploits. These things made the hope for peace, pro peace possible. In 1801, the preliminaries of peace with England and Austria were signed. Peace with England, the Treaty of Amen, or Amiens, was concluded in 1802, and Napoleon was free to give himself to the creative statecraft of which France and Europe through France stood in need. The war had given the country extended boundaries. The treaty with England restored the colonial empire of France and left her in a position of security beyond the utmost dreams of Louis XIV. It was open to Napoleon to work out and consolidate the new order of things, to make a modern state that should become a beacon and inspiration to Europe and all the world. He attempted nothing of the sort. His little, imitative imagination was full of the dream of being Caesar over again. He was scheming to make himself a real emperor with a crown upon his head and all his rivals and schoolfellows and friends at his feet. This could give him no fresh power that he did not already exercise, but it would be more splendid. It would astonish his mother. What response was there in a head of that sort for the splendid creative challenge of the time? But first, France must be prosperous. France, hungry, would not would certainly not endure such an emperor. He set himself to carry out an old scheme of roads that Louis XV had approved. He developed canals in imitation of the English canals. He reorganized the police and made the country safe. And preparing the scene for his personal drama, he set himself to make Paris look like Rome, with classical arches, with classical columns. Admirable schemes for banking developed, or development were available, and he made use of them. In all these things, he moved with the times. They would have happened with less autocracy, with less centralization, if he had never been born. And he set himself to weaken the Republicans whose fundamental convictions he was planning to outrage. He, call, he recalled the émigrés, provided that they gave satisfactory assurances to respect the new regime. Many were very willing to come back on such terms and let bourbons be bygones. And he worked out a great reconciliation, a concordat, with Rome. Rome was to support him, and he was to restore the authority of Rome and the parishes. France would never be obedient and manageable, he thought. She would never stand in a new monarchy without religion. How can you have order in a state, he said, without religion? Society cannot exist without inequality of fortunes, which cannot endure apart from religion. When one man is dying of hunger near another who is ill of surfeit, he cannot resign himself to this difference unless there is an authority which declares, God wills it thus. There must be poor and rich in the world, but hereafter and during all eternity the division of things will take place differently. Religion, and especially of the later Roman brand, was, he thought, excellent stuff for keeping the common people quiet. In his early Jacobin days he had denounced it for that very reason. Another great achievement which marks his imaginative scope and his estimate of human nature was the institution of the Legion of Honor, a scheme for decorating Frenchmen with bits of ribbon which was admirably calculated to divert ambitious men from subversive proceedings. And also, Napoleon interested himself in Christian propaganda. 
here is the Napoleonic view of the political uses of Christ, a view that has tainted all French missions from that time forth. It is my wish to reestablish the institution for foreign missions, for the religious missionaries may be very useful to me in Asia, Africa, and America, as I shall make them reconnoiter all the lands they visit. The sanctity of their dress will not only protect them, but serve to conceal their political and commercial investigations. The head of the missionary establishment shall reside no longer at Rome, but in Paris. These are the ideas of a roguish merchant rather than a statesman. His treatment of education shows the same blindness to the realities of the dawn about him. Elementary education he neglected almost completely. He left it to the conscious of the local authorities, and he provided that the teacher should be paid out of the fees of the scholars. It is clear he did not want the common people to be educated. He had no glimmering of any understanding why they should be, but he interested himself in the provision of technical and higher schools because his state needed the services of clever, self-seeking, well-informed men. This was an astounding retrogression from the great scheme drafted by the Concord set for the Republic in 1792 for a complete system of free education for the entire nation. Slowly but steadfastly, the project of Condorcet comes true. I'll just go to Condorcet. The great nations of the world are being compelled to bring it nearer and nearer to realization and the devices of Napoleon pass out of our interest. As for the education of mothers and wives of our race, this was the quality of Napoleon's wisdom. I do not think that we need to trouble ourselves with any plan of instruction for young females. They cannot be better brought up than by their mothers. Public education is not suitable for them because they are never called upon to act in public. Manners are all in all to them, and marriage is all they look to. The first consul was no kinder to women in the Code Napoleon. A wife, for example, had no control over her own property. She was in her husband's hands. This code was the work very largely of the Council of State. Napoleon seems rather to have hindered than helped its deliberations. He would invade the session without notice and favor its members with lengthy monologues, frequently quite irrelevant to the manner at hand. The council listened with profound respect. It was all the council could do. He would keep his counselors up to unearthly hours and betray a simple pride in his superior wakefulness. He recalled these discussions with peculiar satisfaction in his later years and remarked on one occasion that his glory consisted not in having won 40 battles, but in having created the, co the Code Napoleon. So far as it substituted plain statements for inaccessible legal mysteries, his code was a good thing. It gathered together, revised, and made clear a vast disorderly accumulation of laws old and new. Like all his constructive work, it made for immediate efficiency. It defined things in relation so that men could get the work upon them without further discussion. It was of less immediate practical importance that it frequently defined them wrongly. There was no intellectual power, as distinguished from intellectual energy, behind this codification. It took everything that existed for granted. The fundamental ideas of the civilized community and of the terms of human cooperation were in process or reconstruction all about Napoleon, and he never perceived it. He accepted a phase of change and tried to fix it forever. To this day, France is cramped by this early 19th century straight waistcoat into which he clapped her. He fixed the status of women, the status of laborers, the status of the peasant. They all struggle to this day in the net of his hard definitions. So briskly and forcibly, Napoleon set his mind, hard, clear, and narrow, to brace up France. That bracing up was only a part of the larger schemes that dominated him. His imagination was set upon a new Caesarism. In 1802, he got himself made first consul for life, with the power of appointing a successor, and his clear intention of annexing Holland and Italy, in spite of his treaty obligations to keep them separate, made the peace of Amiens totter crazily from the very beginning. Since his schemes were bound to provoke a war with England, 
He should have waited at any cost until he had brought his navy to superiority over the British navy. He had the control of great resources for shipbuilding, the British government was a weak one, and three or four years would have sufficed to shift that balance. But in spite of his rough experiences in Egypt, he had never mastered the importance of sea power. In 1803, his occupation of Switzerland precipitated a crisis, and war broke out again with England. The weak Addington in England gave place to the greater Pitt. The rest of Napoleon's story turns upon that war. During the period of the consulate, the first consul was very active in advancing the fortunes of his brothers and sisters. This was quite human, very clannish and Corsican, and it helps us to understand just how he valued his position and the opportunities before him. A large factor in the making of Napoleon was the desire to amaze, astonish, and subdue the minds of the Bonaparte family and their neighbors. He promoted his brothers ridiculously, for they were the most ordinary of men. But one person who knew him well was neither amazed nor subdued. This was his mother. He sent her money to spend and astonish the neighbors. He exhorted her to make a display, to live as became the mother of so marvelous, so world-shaking a son. But the good lady, who had birched the man of destiny at the age of sixteen for grimacing at his grandmother, was neither, neither dazzled nor deceived by him at the age of thirty-two. All France might worship him, but she had no illusions. She put by the money he sent her. She continued her customary economies. When it is all over, she said, you will be glad of my savings. We will not detail the steps by which Napoleon became emperor. His coronation was the most extraordinary revival that is possible to imagine. Caesar was no longer the model. Napoleon was now Charlemagne. He was crowned emperor, not indeed at Rome, but in the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. The Pope, Pius VII, had been brought from Rome to perform the ceremony, and at the climax Napoleon I seized the crown, waved the Pope aside, and crowned himself. The injunction of Charlemagne to Louis had at last borne fruit. In 1806, Napoleon revived another venerable antiquity, and, still following the footsteps of Charlemagne, crowned himself with the Iron Crown of Lombardy and the Cathedral of Milan. The four daughter republics of France were now to become kingdoms. In 1806, he set up his brother Louis in Holland and brother Joseph in Naples. But the story of the subordinate kingdoms he created in Europe, helpful though this free handling of frontiers was toward the subsequent unification of Italy and Germany, is too complex and evanescent for this outline. The pact between the new Charlemagne and the new Leo did not hold for very long. In 1807, he began to bully the Pope, and in 1811, he made him a close prisoner at Fontainebleau. There does not seem to have been much reason in these proceedings. They estranged Catholic opinion, as his coronation had estranged liberal opinion. He ceased to stand either for the old or the new. The new he had betrayed. The old he had failed to win. He stood at last for nothing except himself. There seems to have been as little reason in the foreign policy that now plunged Europe into a fresh cycle of wars. Having quarreled with Great Britain too soon, he, 1804, assembled a vast army at Boulogne for the conquest of England, regardless of the naval situation. He even struck a medal and erected a column at Boulogne to commemorate the triumph of his projected invasion. In some Napoleonic fashion, the British fleet was to be decoyed away, the army of Boulogne was to be smuggled across the channel on a flotilla of rafts and boats, and London was to be captured before the fleet returned. At the same time, his aggressions in South Germany forced Austria and Russia steadily into a coalition with Britain against him. In 1805, two fatal blows at any hope he may have had entertained of ultimate victory were struck by the British admirals Calder and Nelson. In July, the former inflicted a serious reverse upon the French fleet in the Bay of Biscay. In October, the latter destroyed the joint fleets of France and Spain at the Battle of Trafalgar. Nelson died splendidly upon the victory, victorious. Thereafter, Napoleon was left with Britain in pitiless opposition, unattainable and unconquerable, able to strike here or there against him all along the coast of Europe. 
For some years, the mortal wound of Trafalgar was hidden from the French mind altogether. They heard merely that storms have ceased us to lose, have caused us to lose some ships of the line after an imprudent fight. After Calder's victory, Napoleon snatched his army from Boulogne, raced it across Europe, and defeated the Austrians at Ulm and Austerlitz. Under these inauspicious circumstances, Prussia came into the war against him and was utterly defeated and broken at the Battle of Vienna, 1806. Although Austria and Prussia were broken, Russia was still a fighting power, and the next year was devoted to this tougher and less accessible antagonist. We cannot trace in any detail the difficulties of the Polish campaign against Russia. Napoleon was roughly handled at Poltusk, which he announced in Paris as a brilliant victory, and again at Elau. Then the Russians were defeated at Friedland, 1807. As yet, he had never touched Russian soil. The Russians were still as unbeaten as the British, but now came an extraordinary piece of good fortune for Napoleon. By a mixture of boasting, subtlety, and flattery, he won over the young and ambitious Tsar Alexander I, he was just 30 years old, to an alliance. The two emperors met on a raft in the middle of the Neman at Tilsit, and there came to an understanding. Alexander had imbibed much liberalism during his education at the court of Catherine II, and was all for freedom, education, and the new order of the world, subject to his own preeminence. He would gladly have everyone free, said one of his early associates, provided that everyone was prepared to do freely exactly what he wished. And he declared that he would have abolished serfdom if it had cost him his head, if only civilization had been more advanced. He made war against France, he said, because Napoleon was a tyrant to free the French people. After Friedland, he saw Napoleon in a different light. These two men met eleven days after that rout, Alexander no doubt in the state of explanatory exaltation natural to his type during a mood of change. To Napoleon, the meeting must have been extremely gratifying. This was his first meeting with an emperor upon terms of equality. Two imaginations soared together upon the raft at Tilsit. What is Europe? said Alexander. We are Europe. They discussed the affairs of Prussia and Austria in that spirit. They divided Turkey in anticipation. They arranged for the conquest of India, and indeed most of Asia. And that Russia should take Finland from the Swedes. And they disregarded the disagreeable fact that the greater part of the world's surface is sea, and that on the seas the British fleet sailed now unchallenged. Close at hand was Poland, ready to rise up and become the passionate ally of France, had Napoleon but willed it so. But he was blind to Poland. It was a day of visions without vision. Napoleon, even then, it seems, concealed the daring thought that he might one day marry a Russian princess, a real princess. But that, he was to learn in 1810, was going a little too far. After Tilsit, there was a perceptible deterioration in Napoleon's quality. He became rasher, less patient of obstacles, more and more the fated master of the world, more and more intolerable to everyone he encountered. In 1808, he committed a very serious blunder. Spain was his abject ally, completely under his control, but he saw fit to depose this Bourbon king in order to promote his brother Joseph from the crown of the two Sicilies. Portugal he had already conquered, and the two kingdoms of Spain and Portugal were to be united. Thereupon the Spanish arose in a state of patriotic fury, surrounding, uh, surrounded a French army at Balen, and compelled it to surrender. It was an astonishing break in the French career of victory. The British were not slow to seize upon the foothold this insurrection gave them. A British army under Sir Arthur Wellesley, afterward the Duke of Wellington, landed in Portugal, defeated the French at Vimiero, and compelled them to retire into Spain. The news of these reverses caused a very great excitement in Germany and Austria, and the Tsar assumed a more arrogant attitude toward his ally. There was another meeting of these two potentates at Erfurt, in which the Tsar was manifestly less amenable to the dazzling tactics of Napoleon than he had been. Followed four years of unstable ascendancy for France, while the outlines on the map of Europe waved about like garments on a clothesline on a windy day. 
Napoleon's personal empire grew by Frank annexations to include Holland, much of Western Germany, much of Italy, and much of the Eastern Adriatic coast. But one by one, the French colonies were failing or were falling to the British, and the British armies in the Spanish peninsula, with the Spanish auxiliaries, slowly pressed the French northwards. All Europe was getting very weary of Napoleon. His antagonists now were no longer merely monarchs and ministers, but whole peoples also. The Prussians, after the disaster of Vienna in 1806, had set to work to put their house in order. Under the leadership of Freiherr von Stein, they had swept aside their feudalism, abolished privilege and serfdom, organized popular education and popular patriotism, accomplished in fact without any internal struggle, nearly everything that France had achieved in 1789. By 1810, a new Prussia existed, the nucleus of a new Germany. And now Alexander, inspired, it would seem, by dreams of world ascendancy, was po posing again as the friend of liberty. In 1810, fresh friction was created by Alexander's objection to Napoleon's matrimonial ambitions. For Napoleon was now divorcing his old helper Josephine because she was childless in order to, content to secure the continuity of his dynasty. Napoleon, thwarted of a Russian princess, snubbed indeed by Alexander, turned to Austria and married the Archduchess Marie-Louise. The Austrian statesmen read him aright. They were very ready to throw him their princess. By that marriage, Napoleon was captured for the dynastic system. He might have been the maker of a new world. He preferred to be the son-in-law of the old. In the next two years, his affairs crumbled apace. He was no longer the leader and complement of the revolution. He no longer embodied the, he no longer no longer the embodied spirit of a world reborn. He was just a new and raw sort of autocrat. He had estranged all free spirited men, and he had antagonized the church. Kings and Jacobins were as one when it came to the question of his overthrow. Britain was now his inveterate enemy. Spain was blazing with the spirit that a Corsican should have understood. It needed only a breach with Alexander I to set this empire of bluff and stage scenery swaying toward, it down, toward its downfall. The quarrel came. Alexander's feelings for Napoleon had always been of a very mixed sort. He envied Napoleon as a rival and despised him as an upstart. Moreover, there was a kind of vague and sentimental greatness about Alexander. He was given to mystical religiosity. He had the conception of a mission for Russia and himself to bring peace to Europe and the world by destroying Napoleon. But bringing peace to Europe seemed to him quite compatible with the annexation of Finland, of most of Poland, and of great portions of the Turkish Empire. And particularly, he wanted to resume trading with Britain, against which Napoleon had set his face. For all the trade of Germany had been dislocated and the mercantile classes embittered by the Napoleonic continental system, which was to ruin Britain by excluding British goods from every country in Europe. Russia had suffered even more than Germany. The breach came in 1811 when Alexander withdrew from the continental system. In 1812, a great mass of armies, amounting altogether to 600,000 men, began to move towards Russia under the supreme command of the new emperor. About half this force was French. The rest was drawn from the French allies and subject peoples. It was a conglomerate army like the army of Darius or Darius or the army of Kavad. The Spanish War was still going on. Napoleon made no attempt to end it. Although altogether it drained away a quarter of a million men from France. He fought his way across Poland and Russia to Moscow before the winter. For the most part the Russian armies declined battle. And even before the winter closed in upon, his, upon him, his position manifestly became manifestly dangerous. He took Moscow, expecting that this would oblige Alexander to make peace. Alexander would not make peace, and Napoleon found himself in much the same position as Darius had been in 2,300 years before in South Russia. The Russians, still unconquered in a decisive battle, raided his communications, wasted his army. Disease helping them, even before Napoleon reached Moscow, 150,000 men had been lost. But he lacked the wisdom of Darius and would not retreat. The winter remained wild, mild for an unusually long time. 
He could have escaped, but instead he remained in Moscow making impossible plans. He had been marvelously lucky at all of his previous gambles with fate. He had escaped undeservedly from Egypt. He had been saved from destruction in Britain by the British naval victories. But now he was in the net again, and this time he was not to escape. Perhaps he would have wintered in Moscow, but the Russians smoked him out. They set fire to and burnt most of the city. It was late in October, too late altogether, before he decided to return. He made an ineffectual attempt to break through to a fresh line of retreat to the southwest, and then turned the faces of the survivors of his grand army towards the country they had devastated in their advance. Immense distances separated them from any friendly territory. The winter was in no hurry. For a week, the Grand Army struggled through mud, then came sharp frost, and then the first flakes of snow, and then snow and snow. Slowly, discipline dissolved. The hungry army spread itself out in search of supplies until it broke up into mere bands of marauders. The peasants, if only in self-defense, rose against them, waylaid them, and murdered them. A cloud of light cavalry Scythians still uh, hunted them down. That retreat is one of the great tragedies of history. At last, Napoleon and his staff and a handful of guards and attendants reappeared in Germany, bringing no army with him, followed only by straggling and demoralized bands. The Grand Army, retreating under Marat, reached Königsberg in a disciplined state but only about a thousand strong out of six hundred thousand. From Konigsberg, Marat fell back to Posen. The Prussian contingent had surrendered to the Russians. The Austrians had gone homeward to the south. Everywhere, scattered fugitives, ragged, lean, and frostbitten, spread the news of the disaster. Napoleon's magic was nearly exhausted. He fled post-haste to Paris. He began to order new levies and gather fresh armies amidst the wreckage of his world empire. Austria turned against him, 1813. All Europe was eager to rise against this defaulting trustee of freedom, this mere usurper. He had betrayed the new order. The old order he had saved and revived now destroyed him. Prussia rose, and the German War of Liberation began. Sweden joined his enemies. Later, Holland revolted. Marat had rallied about 14,000 Frenchmen round his disciplined nucleus in Posen, and this force retreated through Germany as a man might retreat who had ventured into a cage full of drugged lions and found that the effects of the drug were evaporating. Napoleon, with fresh forces, took up chief command in the spring, won a great battle at Dresden, and then for a time he seems to have gone to pieces intellectually and morally. He became insanely irritable with moods of inaction. <coughs> Excuse me. He did little or nothing to follow up the Battle of Dresden. In September, the Battle of Nations was fought round and about Leipzig, after which the Saxons, who had hit hereto, followed his star, went over to the Allies. The end of the year saw the French beaten back into France. 1814 was the closing campaign. France was invaded from the east and the south. Swedes, Germans, Austrians, Russians crossed the Rhine. British and Spanish came through the Pyrenees. Once more, Napoleon fought brilliantly, but now he fought ineffectually. The Eastern armies did not so much defeat him as push past him, and Paris capitulated in March. A little later at Fontainebleau, the emperor abdicated. In Provence, on his way out of the country, his life was endangered by a royalist mob. This was the natural and proper end of Napoleon's career. At last, he was suppressed. And had there been any real wisdom in the conduct of human affairs, we should now have to tell of the concentration of human science and will upon the task his career had interrupted. The task of building up a world system of justice and free effort in the place of the bankrupt ancient order. But we have nothing to tell of the sort. Science and wisdom were conspicuously absent from the great council of the Allies, Came the vague humanitarianism and dreamy vanity of the Tsar Alexander, came the shaken Habsburgs of Austria, the resentful Hohenzollerns of Prussia, the aristocratic traditions of Britain, still badly frightened by the revolution and its conscious all awry with stolen commons and sweated factory children. No peoples came to the Congress, but only monarchs and foreign ministers. 
the Congress had hardly assembled before the diplomatists set to work making secret bargains and treaties behind each other's backs. Nothing could exceed the pomp and splendor of the Congress which gathered at Vienna after a magnificent ceremonial visit of the Allied sovereigns to London. The social side of the Congress was very strong. Pretty ladies abounded. There, were a, there was a galaxy of stars and uniforms, endless dinners and balls, a mighty flow of bright anecdotes and sparkling wit. The brightest spirit of the gathering, gathering was a certain Talleyrand, one of Napoleon's princes, a very brilliant man indeed, who had been a pre-revolutionary cleric, who had proposed the revolutionary confiscation of church estates, and who was now for bringing back the Bourbons. The Allies frittered away precious time in more and more rapacious disputes. The Bourbons returned to France. Back came all the remainder of the émigrés with them, eager for restitution and revenge. One great egotism had been swept aside, only to reveal a crowd of meaner egotists. The new king was the brother of Louis XVI. He had taken the title of Louis XVIII very eagerly so soon as he learnt that his little nephew, Louis XVII, was dead in the temple. He was gouty and clumsy, not perhaps ill-disposed, but the symbol of the ancient system. All that was new in France felt the heavy threat of reaction that came with him. This was no liberation, only a new tyranny, a heavy and inglorious tyranny instead of an active and splendid one. Was there no hope for France but this? The Bourbons showed particular malice against the veterans of the Grand Army, and France was now full of returned prisoners of war who found themselves under a cloud. Napoleon had been packed off to a little consolation empire of his own upon the island of Elba. He was still to be called emperor and keep a certain state. The chivalry or whim of Alexander had insisted upon this treatment of his fallen rival. The Habsburgs had taken away his Habsburg empress, she went willingly enough, to Vienna, and he never saw her again. After eleven months at Elba, Napoleon judged that France had had enough of the Bourbons, he contrived to evade the British ships that watched his island and reappeared at Cannes in France for his last gamble against fate. His progress to Paris was a triumphal procession. He walked on white bourbon cockades. Then for a hundred days, the hundred days, he was master of France again. His return created a perplexing problem, a perplexing position for any honest Frenchman. On the one hand, there was this adventurer who had betrayed the Republic. On the other, the dull weight of old kingship restored. The Allies would not hear of any further experiments in Republicanism. It was the Bourbons or Napoleon. Is it any wonder that, on the whole, France was with Napoleon? And he came back professing to be a changed man. There was to be no more despotism. He would respect the constitutional regime. He gathered an army. He made some attempts at peace with the Allies. When he found these efforts ineffectual, he struck swiftly at the British, Dutch, and Prussians in Belgium, hoping to defeat them before the Austrians and Russians could come up. He did very nearly manage to achieve this. He beat the Prussians at Ligny, but not sufficiently, and then he was hopelessly defeated by the tenacity of the British under Wellington at Waterloo. 1815, the Prussians under Blücher coming in on his right flank as the day wore on. Waterloo ended in a rout. It left Napoleon without support and without hope. France fell away from him again. Everyone who had joined him was eager now to attack him and so efface that error. A provisional government, government in Paris ordered him to leave the country, was for giving him 24 hours to do it in. He tried to get to America, but Rochefort which he reached, was watched by the British cruisers. France, now disillusioned and uncomfortably royalist again, was hot in pursuit of him. He went aboard a British frigate, the Bellerophon, asking to be received as a refugee, but being treated as a prisoner. He was taken to Plymouth, and from Plymouth straight to the lonely tropical island of St. Helena. There he remained until his death from cancer in 1821, devoting himself chiefly to the preparation of his memoirs which were designed to exhibit the chief events of his life in an attractive light. And two of the men with him recorded his conversations and sat down their impressions of him. These works had a great vogue in France and Europe. The Holy Alliance of the Monarchs of Russia, Austria, and Prussia 
to which other monarchs were invited to adhere, labored under the delusion that in defeating Napoleon they had defeated the revolution, turned back the clock of fate, and restored grand monarchy forevermore. The cardinal document of the scheme of the Holy Alliance is said to have been drawn up under the inspiration of the Baroness von Krudener, who seems to have been a sort of spiritual director to the Russian emperor. It opened in the name of the most holy and indivisible trinity, and it bound the participating monarchs, regarding themselves toward their subjects and armies as fathers of families, and considering each other as fellow countrymen, to sustain each other, protect true relig religion, and urge their subjects to strengthen and exercise themselves in Christian duties. Christ, it was declared, was the real king of all Christian peoples, a very Merovingian king, one may remark, with those reigning sovereigns as his mayors of the palace. The British king had no power to sign this document. The Pope and the Sultan were not asked. The rest of the European monarchs, including the Frank King of France, adhered. But the King of Poland did not sign because there was no king in Poland. Alexander, in a mood of pious abstraction, had annexed the greater part of Poland. The Holy Alliance never became an actual legal alliance of states. It gave place to a real League of Nations, the Concert of Europe, which France joined in 1818, and from which Britain withdrew in 1822. There followed a period of peace and oppression in Europe. Many people in those hopeless days were disposed to regard even Napoleon with charity and to accept his claim that in some inexplicable way he had, in asserting himself, been asserting the revolution and France. A cult of him, as of something mystically heroic, grew up in his death. For nearly 40 years, the idea of the Holy Alliance, the Concert of Europe which arose out of it, and the series of congresses and conferences that succeeded the concert, kept an insecure peace in war-exhausted Europe. Two main things prevented that period from being a complete social and international peace, and prepared the way for the cycle of wars between 1854 and 1871. The first of these was the tendency of the royal courts concerned towards the restoration of unfair privilege and interference with freedom of thought and writing and teaching. The second was the impossible system of boundaries drawn up by the diplomatist of Vienna. The disposition of monarchy to march back towards past conditions was first and most particularly manifest in Spain. Here even the Inquisition was restored. Across the Atlantic, the Spanish colonies had followed the example of the United States and revolted against the European great power system when Napoleon set up his brother Joseph upon the Spanish throne in 1810. The Washington of South America was General Bolivar. Spanish, or Spain was unable to suppress this revolt. It dragged on much as the United States War of Independence had dragged on, and at last the suggestion was made by Austria, in accordance with the spirit of the Holy Alliance, that the European monarch should assist Spain in the struggle. This was opposed by Britain and Europe, but it was the prompt action of President Monroe of the United States in 1823 which conclusively warned off this projected monarchist restoration. He announced that the United States would regard any extension of the European system in the Western Hemisphere as a hostile act. Thus arose the Monroe Doctrine, which has kept the great power system out of America for nearly a hundred years and permitted the new states of Spanish America to work out their destinies along their own lines. But if Spanish monarchism lost its colonies, it could at least, under the protection of the Concert of Europe, do what it chose in Europe. A popular insurrection in Spain was crushed by a French army in 1823 with a mandate from a European Congress, and simultaneously Austria suppressed the revolution in Naples. In 1824, Louis XVIII died and was succeeded by that Count d'Artois, who had been hovering as an émigré on the French frontiers in 1789. He took the title Charles X. Charles set himself to destroy the liberty of the press and universities and to restore absolute government. The sum of a billion francs was devoted to compensate the nobles for the chateau burnings and sequestrations of 1789. In 1830, Paris rose against this embodiment of the ancient regime and replaced him by Louis-Philippe, the son of that Philip, Duke of Orléans, who was executed during the Terror. The other continental monarchies, in the face of the open approval of the revolution by Great Britain 
and a strong liberal ferment in Germany and Austria did not interfere in this affair. After all, France was still a monarchy. This young man, Louis Philippe, ruled 1830-48, to 48, remained the constitutional king of France for 18 years. He went down in 1848, a very eventful year for Europe, of which we shall tell in the next chapter. Such were the uneasy swayings of the peace of the Congress of Vienna, which were provoked by the reactionary proceedings of the monarchist. The stresses that arose from the unscientific map-making of the diplomatist gathered force more deliberately, but they were even more dangerous to the peace of mankind. It is extraordinarily inconvenient to administer together the affairs of people speaking different languages and so reading different literatures and having different general ideas, especially if those differences are exacerbated by religious disputes. Only some strong mutual interests, such as the common defensive needs of the Swiss mountaineers, can justify a close linking of peoples of dissimilar languages and faiths, and even in Switzerland there is the utmost local autonomy. Ultimately, when the great power tradition is dead and buried, those Swiss populations may gravitate toward their natural affinities in Germany, France, and Italy. When, as in Macedonia, populations are mixed in a patchwork of villages and districts, the cantonal system is imperatively needed. But if the reader will look at the map of Europe as the Congress of Vienna drew it, he will see that this gathering seems almost as if it had planned the maximum of local exasperation. It destroyed the Dutch Republic. Quite needlessly, it lumped together the Protestant Dutch with the French-speaking Catholics of the old Spanish, Austrian Netherlands, and set up a kingdom of the Netherlands. It handed over not merely the old Republic of Venice, but all of North Italy as far as Milan to the German-speaking Austrians. French-speaking Savoy, it combined with pieces of Italy to restore the Kingdom of Sardinia. Austria and Hungary, already a sufficiently explosive mixture of discordant nationalities, Germans, Hungarians, Czechoslovaks, uh, Yugoslavs, uh, Romanians, and now Italians, was made still more impossible by 1772 and 1795. The Catholic and Republican-spirited Polish people were chiefly given over to the less civilized rule of the Greek Orthodox Tsar, but important districts went to Protestant Prussia. The Tsar was also confirmed in his acquisition of the entirely alien Finns. The very dissimilar Norwegian and Swedish peoples were bound together under one king. Germany, the reader will see, was left in a particularly dangerous state of muddle. Prussia and Austria were both partly in and partly out of a German confederation, which included a multitude of minor states. The King of Denmark came into the German confederation by virtue of certain German-speaking possessions in Holstein. Luxembourg was included in the German confederation, though its ruler was also King of the Netherlands, and though many of its people talked French. Here was a complete disregard of the fact that the people who talk German and base their ideas on German literature, the people who talk Italian and base their ideas on Italian literature, and the people who talk Polish and base their ideas on Polish literature, will all be far better off and most helpful and least obnoxious to the rest of mankind if they conduct their own affairs in their own idiom within the ring fence of their own speech. Is it any wonder that any one of the most popular songs in Germany during this period declared that wherever the German tongue was spoken, there was the German fatherland. Even today, men are still reluctant to recognize that areas of government are not matters for the bargaining and interplay of czars and kings and foreign offices. There is a natural and necessary political map of the world which transcends these things. There is a best way possible of dividing any part of the world into administrative areas and a best possible kind of government for every area, having regard to the speech and race of its inhabitants, and it is our common concern to secure those divisions and establish those forms of government quite irrespective of diplomacies and flags, claims and melodramatic loyalties, and the existing political map of the world. The natural political map of the world insists upon itself. It heaves and frets beneath the artificial political map like some misfitted giant. In 1830, French-speaking Belgium, stirred up by the current revolution in France, revolted against its Dutch association in the Kingdom of the Netherlands. The powers, terrified at the possibilities of a republic or of annexation to France, 
hurried in to pacify the situation, and gave the Belgians a monarch, Leopold I, of saxe coburn gotha There was also ineffectual revolts in Italy and Germany in 1830, and a much more serious one in Russian Poland. A Republican government held out in Warsaw for a year against Nicholas I, who succeeded Alexander in 1825, and was then stamped out of existence with great violence and cruelty. The Polish language was banned, and the Greek Orthodox Church was substituted for the Roman Catholic as the state religion. An outbreak of the natural political map of the world, which occurred in 1821 and ultimately secured the support of England, France, and Russia. This was the insurrection of the Greeks against the Turks. For six years they fought a desperate war while the governments of Europe looked on. Liberal opinion protested against this inactivity. Volunteers from every European country joined the insurgents, and at last Britain, France, and Russia took joint action. The Turkish fleet was destroyed by the French and English at the Battle of Navarino, 1827, and the Tsar invaded Turkey. By the Treaty of Adrianople, 1829, Greece was declared free, but she was not permitted to resume her ancient republican traditions. A German king was found for Greece, one Prince Otto of Bavaria. He gave way to delusions about his divine right and was ejected in 1862 and Christian governors were set up in the Danubian provinces, which are now Romania, and Serbia, a part of the Yugoslav region. This was a partial concession to the natural political map, but much blood had still to run before the Turk was altogether expelled from these lands. A little later, the natural political map was to assert itself in Italy and Germany. The Napoleonic attempt to restore the Roman Empire was reflected with extreme fidelity in the architecture, dress, furniture, and painting of the period. In all these things, there was an attempt to revive the actual forms and spirit of imperial Rome. Women's headdresses and costumes seemed to have flitted out of the museums into the streets. The colonnade, the triumphal arc, swaggered back to the commanding positions of all the great cities. Paris gained her Arc de Triomphe, and London duly imitative her marble arch. The Baroque, the Rococo developments of Renaissance building vanished in favor of austerer facades. Canova, the Italian, was the great sculptor of the period. David, the painter, delighted in heroic nudes. Ingress immortalized Bonaparte princesses as Roman matrons and Roman goddesses. The public of the period as senators. Uh, the public of the period, as, um, the public statues of London present the respectable statesmen and monarchs of the period as senators or emperors. When the United States chose a design for its great seal, it was natural to select an eagle and put its claw and its claws the bolt of Jove.